Today, I wanted to follow up on some of the uh, themes that I was exploring last week. Uh, but before I do, I want to recap a little bit uh, to remind you, and also some of you are new. Uh, so I'm going to briefly review some of the main points. But um, I also want to, once I've done that, really explore how this uh, sense of inner knowing may apply and relate to the practice of uh, RAIN. And um, this will be interesting, the, the, uh, this way of working. I know Rick sent out a, a flyer this morning, uh, for those of you who get the email, uh, talking about the RAIN method. And I thought this would be ideal to see ways that the sense of inner knowing uh, may relate to and help um, actually refine use of that method. So uh, what we explored last time, um, the sense of inner knowing is something that, uh, as I mentioned, I found spontaneously arising in my work with people as a young therapist, um, that as people got in touch with their truth, as they became more authentic, I noticed subtle shifts uh, happening on a somatic level. And uh, my clients, when I, I'm retired as a psychotherapist now, but <clears throat> You know, my clients would report um, subtle shifts somatically in their interior of their body, and um, I could often track and sense that and uh, actually help point those out as well. And it's a very interesting phenomena that the body, particularly as it's increasingly unburdened from conditioning, is very sensitive to um, a deeper authenticity, a deeper reality. And, uh, as we get in touch with our truth on whatever level, personal or transpersonal, the body tends to light up and open up and enliven and, um, and also bring a feeling of be more spacious and, and more settled, all in a very natural and unselfconscious way. Mm -hmm. And I noticed uh, four common ways that that uh, shows up. One is this sense of just natural spaciousness and openness as we get in touch more deeply or more intimate with ourself. Um, there's a feeling of space all around, uh, somewhat like the meditation that we just did with that global feeling of space, maybe a little bit of space or sometimes a dramatic sense of expansion and openness. Also, um, not uncommonly, um, a feeling of warmth in the heart area, mid, mid chest, um, as people gained in self-intimacy and, and were closer really to their core and their experience. Um, and of course, this would take time and often there would be layers to go through, sometimes layers of numbness and discomfort, um, emotional pain, contraction, but eventually a kind of flowering, a sense of warmth, uh, a sense of radiance in the heart area. I would also notice um, a feeling of a sense of lining up, a sense of congruence along a vertical line, midline in the trunk of the body. And one way that was reflected is people would just naturally sit up, right? Instead of slouching left, right, back, or forward, there was just a natural uprightness, um, sense of inner congruence and alignment, which also brought a feeling of aliveness, uh, core or essential aliveness. And finally, a sense of just like, ah, settling down. This really like attention dropping, you know, shoulders relaxing, face relaxing, chest relaxing, belly relaxing, and a deep settling and movement towards grounding uh, as well. So these were subtle movements. And as I suggested last time, some people would feel one and maybe not others or multiple ones, uh, but these are fairly common markers of um, what I am calling the sense of inner knowing, that we have this um, inner guidance system um, that operates by resonance and dissonance. And the phenomenon of resonance we can feel here in meditation in terms of a deep openness and relaxation. Dissonance is like when something is not in accord, out of accord, disharmonious. 
We can feel that interpersonally or um, within ourself if we're in conflict with ourself. So that, those were the main themes that I was enunciating. And, and the value of that is, and this is, I think, particularly important, is because the mind, we can fool ourselves with the mind, with our thinking that something is happening or not happening. And one of the points that I didn't accent and I, I wanted to come around and reinforce, I, I, I also talked about what are, what are some of the uh, factors that obscure um, being in touch with this subtle but powerful inner sense of knowing. One was fear, one is neglect culturally, but one of the most important um, is doubt. And um, I think a lot of people struggle with this. I certainly did for quite a while um, in which there would be subtle openings and insights and revelations. And then my mind would come in and many people's minds come in and would dismiss these and say, ah, that's a cliche, or you're just fooling yourself, or, you know, this isn't real. Has anyone had that experience? You know, raise your hand. <laughs> it's pretty common, you know, to, for the, the, the mind, the critical mind to be dismissive of these spontaneous insights and openings that come. And so doubt, self-doubt in particular, um, is a very strong undermining factor um, in terms of trusting the sense of inner knowing. And really what's important is to be able to see doubt actually as doubt. In other words, to see doubt as a thought and not to uh, view our experience through doubt, but to see doubt as an object in awareness. And that can take some practice actually. Um, but that is an important factor. And, and it will be, it's particularly important when, if we're doing an inner exploration, particularly with our conditioning, or we're really wanting, we're sitting with an essential question, and some subtle but important shift happens, it's very important not to dismiss it. It's very important to let it in. And I'll say more about that when I talk about applications to the RAIN method. Okay, so that was last week. So uh, I was thinking that I would, you know, talk a little bit about um, sitting, the art of sitting with a question. But uh, once I saw the introduction of the RAIN method, I thought this would even be more interesting uh, to kind of go through that method and see how this sense of inner knowing um, could in some ways refine and amplify this method. And we know no method is written in stone. You know, they're created by human beings, they're, they're tried out, they're refined, um, and they, they, you know, they adapt uh, over time. So I wanted to share a few insights I had about um, this particular method and in my own experience, because I work a lot with what obscures, what gets in the way of this natural openness, this, uh, this sense of natural awareness and, and open-heartedness and aliveness and, and authenticity. So uh, briefly, uh, RAIN, uh, the R is about recognizing a particular pattern uh, in terms of our conditioning. Um, the A is about accepting that. Uh, the I is about inquiring or investigating it, and the N stands for not identifying with it. Now, sometimes there are variations on this, I know, but these are kind of the standard accepted definitions. So let's take a look at recognizing um, patterns of conditioning. So our conditioning almost always has three components to it. One component is sens sensory, sensation, what we feel in the body. Um, a, as a sensation. Another is emotion or feeling, um, the, the tone um, <clears throat> or feeling or a reactive feeling. Uh, if we're talking about conditioning and reactions, we're talking about a somatic contraction, a kind of clenching or clutching or freezing um, <clears throat> in the body that can be sensed, um, an emotional reaction it could be shame or rage 
or terror, for instance. These are very common ones. Um, and also the element of cognition or thought. So it's like our, our conditioning is this bundle of sensation and feeling and thought, and sometimes more one than the other. If we're talking about conditioning that happens very early on in childhood, often the cognitive element is not there. So it's mainly just sensed in the body with an emotional charge that goes with that. Um, the cognition may be added on later, um, almost as an afterthought. Uh, if conditioning happens pretty much age four or five on, uh, very often the thought um, and, and the belief is an important component to be able to, um, to investigate. So step one is being able to actually recognize a, the, the kind of contour of a particular issue or problem of conditioning that uh, we want to be with, that we want to face. Um, and it can take a little while to do that, um, to actually kind of, in terms of the somatic element, to actually kind of notice where a reaction will uh, localize in your body. Very often they localize somewhere in the trunk along the midline, in the throat, and very often as a feeling of constriction or contraction. And this is where this kind of sense of inner knowing is very relevant because we can, when we're getting in touch with our truth, we can feel these sense of warmth and melting and opening and spaciousness and grounded. And the opposite is also true. Like when we're living with um, an old story or an old imprint that's no longer relevant to our present conditioning, the opposite will be true. There'll be a contraction rather than expansion. Um, so this is very interesting to notice this. So somatically, we may notice uh, where it localizes, and we may notice um, where our attention is drawn first, because sometimes there can be contractions in different areas of the body. And of course, it can be in the head, it can be in the legs, the feet, the arms, um, and, and on the periphery of the body. But very often, the core contraction uh, tends to localize along the midline in the trunk of the body. Um, from the base of the spine up through throat, but certainly in the forehead uh, as well. We can notice what emotions may go with that somatic contraction. And so, for instance, if there's a contraction in the heart area, it's not unusual for there to be a sense of shame or unworthiness, uh, <clears throat> low self-esteem. Um, and there's a particular color of emotion, a particular tone of feeling that we can tell is associated with that particular contraction in the body. And very often, not always, there is a core limiting belief that goes with this contraction reaction. Uh, and very often um, can be summarized in five words or less in a child's language. I'm no good. No one loves me. No, I'm flawed. I'm not enough. Very simple, not big sophisticated adult words, but you know, really simple child words. I'm bad. I'm no good. I'm screwed up. Something's wrong with me. Something like that. And it's very interesting to actually kind of find the words, the little phrase, that actually fits with that somatic contraction and emotional reaction. And just kind of fine tune the words so you get it, um, kind of in the language of a child. I find uh, helping people uh, do that uh, really kind of focuses in on you know, what the whole bundle of conditioning is about. So this is, uh, for me, part of the process of recognizing a pattern. And, mm -hmm. If you, if you have a belief, then you, you see, is there an emotional charge with it? And is there a corresponding contraction in the body? And a little bit of fine tuning really makes a difference. So the second step of accepting, uh, of course, is very important. And we you know, are enjoined to be non-judgmental, um, to accept whatever this particular pattern is, 
you know, reaction, emotional reaction and contraction. I would suggest at, that the mind has a limited capacity for acceptance. Um, that the conditioned mind actually can only conditionally accept uh, a particular experience. And to expect the mind to do more than it's able to uh, is unrealistic and also rather unkind. Um, the good news is there's something beyond ordinary mind, whatever we want to call it. Um, we may want to call it big mind or bare attention or loving awareness or uh, wakeful awareness. There is something actually that completely accepts our experience just as it is, our conditioning just as it is. And so very often when I work with people, once we've kind of been able to um, focus on, on um, particularly on where it localizes somatically, and this is a point I skipped over, um, very often in therapy, people you know, try to work on the level of thinking, um, and that can be helpful in terms of rational thought. Um, and questioning irrational beliefs and so on. But very often, these contractions are subconscious and these imprints are deep in the body. And so I find working with sensation and feeling is much more direct, kind of goes to the heart of the matter. Uh, and, then, and then I'll check and see if there's a, a core limiting belief that's relevant. And sometimes that'll be the most important element. But I generally start by, you know, where in the body does this localize? And so that's part of the recognition process. Then what I do is I invite people to actually let it all go. It's almost like put it down. Okay, now that you've recognized it, um, don't go to your mind in terms of trying to accept it. Actually, let's relax back. And it's, it's an invitation. It's like rest back now. Take a few deep breaths. You know, and we can... If you feel like it, you know, you can play with this now and just let your attention rest back into a background space of awareness and feel a sense of just natural openness that's here already. This, will, this little step usually takes about a minute. People who are very experienced can attune within a few seconds. Um, but often within a minute, there's a feeling of, okay, I'm not in my analytic mind. I'm in a more relaxed and open space. I find this is very important and very helpful for accepting. Um, so we're not, we're able to actually from this open, spacious, more spacious awareness, and it will vary according to our familiarity with it, but to whatever degree it's available, then we welcome in to this spacious awareness, this contracted state of conditioning. In other words, we're contacting open awareness and welcoming in rather than with the mind trying to go into it. Can you hear the difference? Can you feel the difference? It's subtle, but very important. I used to practice as a therapist. I would just like go into the problem. <laughs> with my mind, uh, along with my clients. And sometimes it would be helpful and sometimes not. But almost always, it's much more helpful to start. We're resourcing ourselves, really, in a sense of open, spacious awareness. Why? Because it's naturally accepting. And in our welcoming of the experience, we do not have an agenda to fix or change it. Critically important. Minds want to fix and change themselves, right? It's all, we're always working on ourselves, trying to improve ourselves. And uh, it, it is, by the way, an endless project and uh, ultimately futile. <laughs> but in terms of some per state of perfection, right? But if from this open awareness, we welcome our experience, without an agenda to fix or change it, but rather to get to know it better, to be intimate with it. It's very important and it makes all the difference because if we have an agenda, 
conscious or subconscious, to fix or change, we will engender resistance on some level to whatever it is that we're wanting to work with. So welcoming experience without an agenda to fix or change is the true field of acceptance, and it provides an optimal field for transformation. When we meet someone new, you know, and they want to get to know us, and if we feel like they have an agenda to fix or change us, how do we respond? Right? We can feel it, can't we? You know, if it's direct or indirect or whatever, it's in the field. And of course, you know, we're going to resist that. But if we feel a genuine interest, oh, they want to get to know who I am or how I am, and I'm not going to be judged, naturally we're going to want to unfold and share. You know, obviously, if we feel safe enough and it's a you know, right person. A similar principle in terms of working with our inner experience. And it's not too surprising because a lot of our inexperience and knots and tensions are generated in our childhood. So in a way, we're kind of working with our inner kids and inner children. So starting from spacious awareness is really helpful in terms of engendering an optimal field of exploration, right? of just being intimate. And that can happen on a level of just sensing what's here. It's really interesting to just notice what happens when we're just willing to sense and feel what's here, to meet our experience as it is. And very often that's enough, just in that openness, that innocence, that affectionate attention, that curiosity that comes from open awareness, there will start to be just a natural unfolding, just like a bud opens to the sun. You know, it's just natural that that would happen without the mind trying to make it happen. We don't have to peel the petals apart. The bud will open of its own in the right environment. So this is, now we're into third stage, which is the investigation or the inquiry. The investigation, being intimate with experience, getting close to it, wanting to really know, what is this? Like, what's in the center of this? What's this all about? And just waiting in that kind of innocent, open awareness um, invites uh, a natural flowering, uh, whatever that may be. And another part of the investigation or the inquiry is if there is a core belief. Now, if the, that sensation does not, it remains closed, very often uh, there's a core belief, a very simple thought that goes with that. And if we can name that thought and then step back from it and ask ourselves, what is my deepest knowing about this belief? What is the truth? And then just let the question go. What is my deepest knowing about this belief that I am unworthy, that I am unlovable? And not go to our mind for an answer. This is a critical point. Because usually if we ask a question, we, we start thinking about it. It's more, we ask the question, we drop it into the pond. And then we just wait. We sense, we feel. Then the sense of inner knowing that I was talking about last week and at the beginning of today's talk can emerge. And it can emerge as a felt sense, uh, a subtle feeling sensation, it can arise spontaneously as an image or a word or as a direct knowing. It's, it's an art, this, this kind of communicating, opening to this different way of knowing, this inner sense of knowing, felt sense, if you will. So there's your R, there's your A, there's your I. And instead of an N, which is always good not to identify with whatever your experience is, I would substitute an L for letting in. You know, and Rick teaches about letting in the good. This is like letting in the true. 
letting in the insight, letting in the subtle knowing that is available to you. And I find that this letting in of deep felt insight is where the real transformation happens. It's enough to have the, it's beautiful to have the insight, but we need to let it in. It's like letting the light of awareness into the conditioned body mind. It's like opening the door to the basement or to that musty old room that's been locked away, you know, opening the curtains, opening the window, letting in the fresh air. It's like, let in the new information, let in the new energy. Yeah. And then just notice what happens. This is where a shift will happen. A very deep, a very powerful, and a very meaning, meaningful shift. And that's it. That's really the core of it. And of course, we may need to revisit multiple times. Um, and we may need to accent um, more the feeling sensation, or we may need to accent the inquiry into what the belief is. It kind of depends, you know, how the, what the configuration is. But very interestingly, and quite surprisingly to me in my work with people and these kind of untying these subtle knots releases enormous energy and is a very quick path to essential qualities of being and to our true nature. So in other words, when we face our fear and really become intimate with it, we discover our fearlessness. When we face our shame and really lean into it and feel into it and question it, we discover that which is our innocence, right? And so rage, we discover our power and so on. So in other words, these obscurations are also potential portals to our deeper nature. So in this, this is really a movement of embracing our humanity, embracing our conditioned self and complementary um, to the sense of just resting, you know, in a very open, spacious state. We use that capacity, that greatest resource of openness in terms of welcoming the conditioned body mind. And in this way, conditioned body mind begins to orient to this openness, acclimate and orient and embody our deeper knowing. And I think we're all interested in that, you know, not just to have this knowing on, the, on our Zafus, you know, and at Spirit Rock and, or wherever we're sitting and whatever you know, teachers or practices we're doing, but to live it in our life, right? To live this aliveness, to live this authenticity. So just sharing some insights about ways to be with our conditioning that I found have worked um, powerfully and beautifully. Okay, that's enough. I actually went on a little longer than I meant to, but we've got a little over 15 minutes to talk. And um, you know, what I'd like to do is just speak directly with people. Last time it took time to read through all the comments and figure out what kind of question might be relevant. And I just find it more direct uh, to dialogue, you know, to have the conversation directly. So if you um, have something you'd like to share, a question or a response, I'd be very happy to chat with you. So let's open it up. Hi, thank you. This was really great. Um, Hi. I might have to... Um... I'm getting a message of low power mode. Um, so let me just. Well, I'm it's sorry. good. It's good for now, and this will be probably pretty quick anyway. What is your name? Uh, Kathleen. Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. So I've been practicing rain for a while. Um, uh -huh. I enjoyed your your talk and and your explanations of of the practice because hearing everyone's version helps integrate it a little yeah, bit more exactly and, and they'll be a little different won't they mm -hmm. yeah and it's you know sometimes you hear have to hear things five and ten times to you know it's always it's or a like, hundred oh, yeah. times yeah if you yeah mean. yeah <laughs> okay i'm with you um so what i notice comes up for me sometimes is the hurt part wants to disassociate and check out Oh yeah. And when that comes up, 
during rain, I'm not sure what to do and how to be with it. And I know, I guess I get scared in a way, right? Because I'm like, oh, here's that part again. So I'm thinking as as I've taken in your talk about the accepting part, um, that, that that's, I'm kind of answering my own question, aren't I? I'm, yes, it's you about are. allowing that part. That's right. To, Okay. Yeah, allowing the part to check out, you know, allowing the part to distance. And this is a protective, self-protective movement. And so it's important to honor that. And and so we get close, we we just kind of approach it in a very respectful and kind way. And then we wait, you know, patiently, lovingly, uh, generously, um, and just notice what happens. And sometimes um you know we have maybe judged that part in the past and so it feels a little distrustful of us you know because it doesn't want to be judged again but if it feels a genuine quality of non-judgment then there's going to be a natural movement towards that because there's a movement it actually wants to be understood you know it wants to be embraced it wants to be included it doesn't want to live in exile you know it just does that in order to be safe so when it feels an atmosphere of genuine acceptance and safety, there will be a natural movement of closeness and of revelation as well. That makes sense. As I'm listening to you, I'm realizing I almost need to nurture this part. Exactly. You know, of course, you're going to check out if, you know, of course, you don't feel safe. Exactly. Just like that. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're I so really welcome. It. Yeah, you're very welcome. I think Edward is up. So in the meditation last time, as well as today, you suggested that when we're feeling the weight of our body, that rather than what I'm used to of being supported, that we be held. And I could feel my judgment or reactivity to that. Uh -huh. Not wanting to allow being embraced. Uh -huh. And as you were in the beginning of the talk, guiding us into what's what's the constriction right now for me, it was deep in the lower part of my pelvis. Yes. In a sense of shame and embarrassment. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it was delightful being with your suggestions and guidance as with the investigation of it and being with it, there was just a real warmth in my heart and a welcoming okayness. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so we, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this yeah. is both very familiar and delightful. Ah, uh, good. So the other piece that I want to share of my experience in the meditation as awareness and attention was dropped from head into heart mm -hmm. and with the breathing and spaciousness, there was that familiar now dissolution of boundary of body uh -huh. and while i tend to stay centered in that place around my heart area um today there was really a almost spontaneous lifting of energy into my third eye and into my crown uh -huh. And with the vision or insight of the Ajna Center, there was no longer an inside or outside. That is correct. That, that it wasn't even, initially I labeled it as transcending opposites. It's like that wasn't even a question it, in that field that doesn't even arise as a thought or experience. That's correct. Yeah, that's just a clear seeing of what's so. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So the, um, as we speak, my attention is drawn to the base of the spine. Okay. And, you know, beautiful openness here, beautiful openness of the heart. And there, I suspect, correct me if I'm wrong, Edward, but I think there is some fear of disillusion of, of maybe, you know, loss of self. If this, you know, completely opens up. Yes. Is that accurate? Okay. And so that will be a good area to investigate. You know, there, there, you, you name shame, but I believe there's also fear here and a kind of core survival fear. And if you lean into that and qu- feel into it and welcome it and question it, it will start to soften and open for you. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, Dea. Thank you, Edward. I'm not quite sure exactly how to explain this so that it gets to the heart of it. Um, working with you isn't new to me. Um, and what I felt tonight was um, some, often I feel tightness in my jaw and my mouth. Um, but today I felt that, but I also felt a heaviness kind of on my right shoulder, kind of like if you have a helmet and you put it on and it rested right here, but more on the right. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and um, and I can feel it right now, but interestingly enough, like I can feel into the rest of myself where I'm not really bounded. You uh-huh. know, it's like uh-huh. my space everywhere else is uh-huh. much more undefined. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, and this isn't unfamiliar to me, this tightness in my mouth, the tightness in my shoulders is not familiar. Uh-huh. But it's, um, you know, there's, there's a lack sense of something I've held on to for a long time and a less than and I'm not sure which is the most childish description of it. Um, uh-huh. But there's also a real tiredness of this. It's like, how long is this going to be? I mean, the, the spaciousness has increased over time. So it's uh-huh. not like I feel desolate, but it's like kind I, of stuck. I understand a stuck place and the mind would like it to change. Right. Spacious awareness does not have an agenda, <laughs> a time agenda, but the mind definitely does. You know, something uncomfortable, we would like to be freed of it. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but kind of this right side experience, weight on the shoulder and tightness here. Um, so you had mentioned possible beliefs, you know, lack or less than. Um, as, as you just sit with it for a moment, and ask, is there a thought or belief that goes with this sensation? What comes to you? It's fear that that's true. Fear that you are lacking or less than? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Correct. Okay. So take a breath and let it go. Feel a sense of space all around. And then inquire, what's my deepest knowing? What's the truth now? And be quiet. Just notice what happens. It's not completely gone, but it's kind of like maybe ice melting, but that 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 steam comes off of the tightness in the right uh-huh. side of my uh-huh. shoulder, uh-huh. and I can feel some lippy quivery Uh Uh 
and some letting go. Yeah. So I would suggest you continue to sit with the inquiry. Okay. Just opening to what's true now and, and to this, whatever this unfolding is. It feels like, you know, a, a upward opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can sit with this. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're very welcome. Perhaps quickly, one more. Right. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Similar. Hi, dear. Hello. Hello. Asimo. Hi. Hi. Um, when we got to the core belief question, oh, wait, I should say first, the problem, which I did feel, I mean, I felt like I was able to move through the first part and recognize, it, but to op be open first. Mm -hmm. And then um, what, what I start, felt starting here was fear. Mm -hmm. And as I um, sought to accept it, um, asked myself to accept it, it grew stronger uh -huh. and almost more solid. Uh -huh. And when I asked myself about the what core belief uh -huh. it's based on, I couldn't think, I couldn't come up with anything. And it just got stronger and stronger and it was kind of scary. Oh. Hmm. Um, and I, 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 I just well, asked ask okay. myself the question, you know, maybe I just need to sit with that question. Maybe I don't have an answer for it. Yeah, maybe not right away. But if I were to ask you um, or ask this part, what is it you are afraid of or what is it that you fear? And if you just listen, or, or maybe an image arises, what comes to you? I start getting tears in my eyes, but I don't, I don't have an image. Okay. So there's some tears. Okay. We'll stay with it a little more. Just kind of curiosity. What is this fear about? Very innocent. Feeling. It's about feeling. Feeling. Uh-huh. Getting some shivers up my back. Uh-huh. Okay. And, um, uh, I feel like I wish I could cry. Yeah, it sounds like there's a natural movement to cry. Probably it's been suppressed. Yeah. Maybe it felt unsafe. It's, um, yeah. Uh -huh. There's been a lot of loss in the past year, so. Yeah, a lot of grief. I, I cried and wailed when my cat died, but when my brother and my best friend died, uh, I couldn't, I didn't really get to oh. feel freedom. Oh. So I think we have some clues here, you know, yeah. that, that the fear is of feeling deeply and maybe getting lost in that feeling, you know, that it would overwhelm you or become too much. Uh, at least in terms of recent grief. And there may be an other story about, you know, it was never safe to feel deeply or to express grief or any kind of feeling. And so the question, you know, it's like, so, you know, part of it is just allowing the feeling now. You can do it sort of in a safe way. Do a little bit, step back, do a little bit more. You don't have to do it all at once. You know, titrate it, in other words. And you can also question, like, is that true? Is it unsafe now to feel? Is it unsafe now to cry? What, not again rationally, but what's, what's my deepest knowing about that now? That now question is very important because it may have been unsafe before, but now, is it unsafe? What's the truth? So 
we'll have to end there because we're at the end of the program. Thank and you I, so much. Yeah, I appreciate your honesty and vulnerability. Okay. So let's come back to the group as a whole. And uh, obviously this is very evocative. It touches you know, a depth. Um, and uh, I don't mean to be doing psychotherapy <laughs> with the group, uh, but it's more just like giving a few hints you know, about um, how to be intimate with your own experience in a way that's really uh, supportive and facilitative. Uh, and to trust, trust a deeper, um, a deeper sensitivity and a deeper knowing um, that's in each of you. So I appreciate your attention and uh, it's been nice to, to be lovely to be with you. <laughs>